And we're heading right to our next session. Great Lakes author, Jerry Dennis. This conference, it still takes the power of story to reach out uh, to the greater public and inspire a broader audience into the work that we're doing. And Jerry is one of those storytellers. So please join me in welcoming Jerry Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here, meet so many people who are out there with their boots on the ground. Um, usually when I speak, it's to students or to the general public. Um, I recognize the value of what you guys are doing, and I know, um, I know how challenging that can be. Um, Eric Stern and I were having an interesting conversation this morning, and he was filling me in a little about um, the field of eco-environmentalism, or eco-psychology, and um, a field I, I, I want to learn more about. I'm very interested in what he had to say. But I realized as we were talking that um, it's the field I've been involved in for many years. I'm most interested in the way we respond to nature, and the way, um, specifically, we respond to the Great Lakes. This is the area where I grew up. I, I grew up on northern Lake Michigan, near Traverse City, near Sleeping Bear Dunes, literally in the shadow of Sleeping Bear Dunes, where my, where my mother grew up and where my grandfather was a member of the U.S. Life Saving Service on, at Grand Haven and on South Manitou Island. So I grew up hearing stories about shipwrecks and storms. And, and um, the Great Lakes, of course, wound deeply through my life. So as I travel around um, doing my work as a journalist, as a, as a creative writer, and, and speaking to people, I'm always attuned to their opinions about um, the Great Lakes, the stories they tell, which are, of course, the most revealing way a person can t talk about their life and their experiences. And I, um, and I pay attention to that. And I'm, and I'm noticing lots of changes, which I'll get back to in a moment. Um, one of the challenges, of course, for anyone who writes about the Great Lakes or anyone who works on the Great Lakes is that though this is one of the largest and most complex ecoregions in North America, it's also one of the least understood and the least appreciated. And we've all had plenty of experiences with that, um, people who don't understand that you can't see across them, for instance. Um, and I, I want to share one story that, I, that is sort of indicative that. I could share a lot of stories about that. Um, I'll, I'll give a real quick one, too. When I first proposed to my editor in a New York publishing house um, about 10 years ago that I wanted to write a book about the Great Lakes, um, he had already published several of my books and was behind me 100%. Anything I wanted to write, he said. I said, okay, I'm going to write a book I've wanted to write since I was in college, a book about the Great Lakes, one that captures the And he goes, eh, not very sexy. Now, this is a guy who's traveled the world. He's Ivy League educated. And I never. from England came up next to me. See and I one can't see Wisconsin. And my editor goes, Whoa, wait, you can't see across Lake Michigan? And I said, No, you can't see across Lake Michigan. He says, Oh, well if I didn't know that, lots of people don't know that do that book. And that's why I got the contract. or even my publication. A magazine editor in New York writing and asked, you're from Iowa or Ohio or one of those places, aren't you? He thought both were Great Lakes State. He had no clue. He would have been shocked to learn 
they're too large to see across. But river are bound by eight states, two provinces, and nearly 200 miles. Or that they are encircled by as many miles of shoreline as the coast of the United States. Or that pollution has not reduced them to toxic cesspools. Editors of a Utah decided to profile the Great Lakes. Their research directed them to a website It was an that they decided to make a feature story titled in Michigan. In the spring, the freshwater whales and freshwater dolphins begin their 1,300 mile migration from the warmer waters of Lake Michigan. They locks at Sault Ste. Marie, the whales and dolphins prefer to ford Canadian rivers until breeding grounds in southern Lake Michigan. There they feed on a popular lake trout and zebra. Southern shores of Lake Michigan many centuries ago. Harris. Behind the story. We at study this to be a lesson to you all, to you all as well. The retraction read, not all web are true. So you can see what we're up against. T Ten years ago, I, I was confronted with this challenge. I wanted to write books about the Great Lakes. I wanted to write for national publications to great, about the Great Lakes. But I wanted to um, grab people. I, and I knew, as a reader myself, that I didn't want um, to be pre preached to. I didn't want to be made to feel guilty about my lifestyle. I wanted to be, I wanted to read compelling stories. And that's the way I approached this, um, but I was having a hard time figuring out how to do that. Um, for the first couple years that I was working on the Living Great Lakes, I didn't know what to do. I just ended up driving around all five lakes twice and stopping and talking to people and taking notes and, and just struggling and struggling and struggling to find a way into, into this amazing place. And even though I'd lived here all my life, I just didn't feel like I was getting a grip on it. And then I had an amazing ex experience, a, um, just a stroke of blind luck that really started with um, something I read um, about a meteorologist for the National Weather Service who had been doing some research. He'd been gathering weather data from last century about the Great Lakes and was interested in finding the, the day of the year in which the temperature differential between the surface water and the air above it was at its greatest. That is the point meteorologists tell us when storms are most likely to occur. When you get that energy from that rising heat from the lake, lakes meeting that colder air in the atmosphere and it creates um, storms or it intensifies the storms that are sweeping down from Canada or across from the plains. And after analyzing all this data, he came up with the date of November 10th. Well that, of course, rang a bell. I started looking in my notes and I found storm after storm after storm, the legendary storms on the Great Lakes all occurred about, the, about November 10th. The big blow of 1913 with hurricane strength winds, 30 foot waves that sank a dozen ships and drowned more than 250 people was on November 7th through the 11th. The Armistice Day storm of 1940 sank three bulk carriers, um, killing 
58 people, also killed about 50 duck hunters who were in marshes along Lake, Lake Michigan that day. That occurred on November 11th. The storm that sank the 600-foot lake carrier, the Carl D. Bradley, was on November 18th, and that killed the whole crew of 33 men. And of course, the most famous of all, the Edmund Fitzgerald, at 729 feet, with the loss of a whole, the entire crew of 29, that was on November 10th, 1975. Well, exactly 23 years later, on November 10th, 1998, I woke up at my home on Old Mission Peninsula, near Traverse City, to a sound I had never heard before. And I realized that it was the wind in the trees above our house. Our, ho our house is an old two-story farmhouse. And I got up and looked out the window, and branches were down, trees were whipping. I went in the bathroom. The water in the toilet bowl was sloshing. The house was swaying so much in this wind. So I turned on the television and went online and discovered that the winds in Traverse City were at 65 miles an hour. Um, and that in the Straits of Mackinac, they were 80. And 75 is hurricane strength. And so I woke my wife up and I said, I have to head to Lake Superior. I have to see Lake Superior in this storm. Because this is the anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I had to see, because I'm trying to write about this, um, this amazing wreck and um, loss of life, and I had no feel for it. So I threw a sleeping bag and, and a few things in, in my truck, and my Ford Explorer, my brother-in-law keeps laughing at me when I call it a truck. And it's a truck, right? and <laughs> headed north and got to the, to the Straits. And luckily, just before I got there, they opened the bridge, the Mackinac Bridge up for the first time. And um, before that, it was just closed. They wouldn't let anyone through. So they, they were letting us go in caravan at a 20 mile an hour speed limit. And going across, the wind is so strong that my explorer is like this. And I had to crank the wheel to keep going straight. Now this wind was from the east, which is very unusual, of course. It's usually the front of a cyclonic front. And um, the storm that sank the Fitzgerald was from the northwest. But still, this was incredible. That wind was funneling through the Straits of Mackinac with such force, and the waves were so big that um, lake carriers were lined up behind Bablo Island in the lee of the island, which I, in all my life of traveling the Great Lakes, I've never seen them do. I've seen them come into bays like Grand Traverse Bay. They'll come in to wait out a storm, but I've never seen them lined up like that behind an island. I got across the bridge and the power was out all across the UP. Everything in the Upper Peninsula was shut down. And um, within minutes I'm on the road to Whitefish Point um, and I'm the only road, car on the road. Trees were down all the way across the road. So I, twice I had to go into the ditch to get around fallen trees. Um, I think it may be indicative of UP character, and I say this with great fondness, that the only lights I saw were candles in the bars that I passed. Um, <laughs> so I got up to Whitefish Point, and if, for those of you who've been there, you know what it's like. It's at the point where the big expanse of Lake Superior funnels into Whitefish Bay. Whitefish Bay is about 30 miles by 30 miles. There's a big body of water by itself. But to the west is wide open Lake Superior as far as you can see. And so the wind that day was coming just across 30 miles of Whitefish Bay from the east, and it was still 10-foot waves. And they were pounding. They were just crashing. I, I walked down to the point, and the sand made it impossible to stay there. I couldn't see. I, all I could do was watch the waves a little bit, and then I had to get out of there. So I went back down the shoreline, too. There's a, on the east side of the point, there's a marina with some commercial fishing boats and some recreational boats moored there. And there's a break wall. And um, the waves were hitting that break wall and shooting, I estimated, um, two stories in the air. High, half again as high as this, some of them. Some of, most of them maybe were this high, but big waves, big spray hitting. And I tried to take photographs, it was impossible. I felt like I was sitting in an automated car wash. My windshield wipers going as fast as they'd go and just whoosh, whoosh, the spray. I'm 100 yards from the water and that spray was hitting with that much force. I tried to get out, put a camera on tripod, impossible. I couldn't hold the camera steady. So I'm just sitting in my truck watching. All of a sudden I realize that out on that break wall, there's a human being. I see this figure dressed in black, carrying some kind of instruments or equipment of some kind. And it turned out to be a man. And he would be huddled over his instrument. And then the wave would come. And he'd turn his back to it. And that spray 
and breaking wave would go right over him. And I just thought, I'm going to see this person die, and there's nothing I can do about it. But he made it off. He got off, and he went to his, his vehicle, and I, I went over to meet him. It turned out he was photographing. He was filming the storm. He said he worked for the Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point, and that they were making a documentary about Great Lakes storms that they could show in the museum. And he just saw this as a great opportunity to get some footage, and he had that bright-eyed look, you know. <laughs> And I, I said, no, that's amazing. And I told him what I was doing. And his eyes lit up again. And he goes, well, are you here for the reunion? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, the Fitzgerald reunion is this afternoon um, at, the, at the museum. Why don't you come join us? Well, it turns out that the families of the men that were lost on the Fitzgerald in 1975 have been meeting every year for, for all those years on the anniversary to reminisce and at the um, end of their, their meeting, they ring the, the bell from the Fitzgerald 29 times in commemoration. So I was given this opportunity to be the only outsider. I just sat in the back of the room. Now, the power is still out, and the museum is beautiful. It's full of brass and glass shipwreck artifacts. And it was lined with candles all the way around. So it was all this twinkling candlelight reflecting off all these surfaces. And there were about 100 people there, and they all knew each other. They came in carrying trays of cookies, plates of cookies and cupcakes, and they were hugging, and there were tears. And um, then they all took seats, and I, I sat in the back and just watched. And um, they had a, had a special guest, a man named um, John Lufkins, who at that time was 55 years old, and he was the administrator of the Bay Mills Indian tribe. Um, and he's a very dignified man in a blazer, and he, and he stood up, um, and you could tell he was kind of shy. And um, he said, I have a story to tell that I have not told many people. And he proceeded to tell us about being on Lake Superior the day the Fitzgerald sank. He was a commercial fisherman in 1975, and he was 32 years old at that time, and um, had gone out um, the morning of the day before the, the Fitzgerald sank. On he and his brother-in-law, who was 18 years old, had gone out in their small boat, a 16-foot open boat with an outboard motor, headed out toward the middle of Whitefish Bay to um, draw in their gill nets. And he said it was a typical November day on Lake Superior. Now, this is a guy who had been fishing Lake Superior all his life, and very typical for November, you know, one to two-foot waves and overcast and in the temperature in the 40s, not bad. Um, and they went out expecting no problem at all. They got out and they, they were starting to draw in their first net. And um, he sensed something, some activity off to the west, out of the corner of his eye. And he looked and he could see at the mouth of the bay, where the open part of the lake meets, he could see a line of white on the water, that he, unlike anything he'd ever seen. And he was watching it and suddenly realized that it was froth, that it was waves being blown to pieces by a strong wind. And that it, as he was watching, he could see it was coming toward him very fast. And he just said, we have to get out of here. And he realized how treacherous it was, was and how vulnerable they were, and to the point where they, he just told his brother-in-law, let's cut the lines, because they had the net halfway in. They cut the lines, lost this $1,000 net, and headed for shore. Well, they didn't make it. They only got a short distance, and they were overtaken by this wind and instantly realized they couldn't run with it or they were going to be swamped from the stern. So their only hope was to turn into these waves and wind. And um, about in the middle of the bay is a small island called Tequamanan Island. So he said, let's head for the island. And it was their only chance, he figured, and um, it was pretty much on a line with them. Within minutes, foot waves to three to four foot waves, then to five to six foot waves. And it was, it was climbing. They were climbing fast. It was the temperature dropped from the 40s to the 20s. Snow and sleet and the spray hitting them. Um, he knew their only chance was to get to this island. On the island, you know, they'll deal with what they can do to try to stay warm. Well, they made it. They got there. And um, one of them was beyond repair and no roof on it. But the other one had a roof, walls were pretty solid, had a door. And they got inside it and they found that it had an old oil burning furnace in it with a couple inches of, of fuel oil in it and they got it lit. So they knew they were going to be okay. 
and they were kind of settling in. They'd pulled the boat up way up on the beach and taken their, their gear out. He always carried a garbage bag with a couple of sleeping bags in it for emergencies. So they had sleeping bags. They had no food, but they were going to be okay. Suddenly the door flies open, and here's a, another commercial fisherman that he knows, another one from the tribe, who said, our boat, our boat swamped, my buddy is in the water. So they ran down to the beach, and they got there just as this guy was, was pulling himself out of the waves. And he got up, and now this was on the lee side of the island, so it wasn't as big waves as on the other side, of course. So they got him up and got him out of his wet clothes and by the furnace, and you know he was going to be okay as well. Well, John said that he um, decided it was getting dark by then. So he decided he was going to walk around the island one time just to make sure he didn't, that there wasn't anybody else out there because he didn't know who was out fishing that day. And so he, he did and didn't see anything. He made sure the boat was secure, everything's right. So he goes back to the shack and as he's starting to close the door behind him to go inside for the night, the wind caught the door and flung it open. And, and he said when he reached for it, he caught a flash of orange out of the corner of his eye on the lake. And he turned and looked, and then he saw it again, and he realized it was a life preserver. Somebody was out on the water. So he said, I've got to, told the other guys, I've got to go out there. His brother-in-law wanted to go with him. He wouldn't let him. He said, no, I'm going to have to do this alone. You guys stay here. Um, pushed the boat out in the water, immediately started sinking. He'd forgotten to put the plug back in. <laughs> and um, they pulled him back up, drained the boat, put the plug in, and he went out there. Well, he couldn't find, the, find this what he had seen, but he knew about the general direction, so he started heading for it. Well, he said within minutes of leaving the island and leaving the protection of the lee side of the island, he was in 10-foot waves. And the wind was so strong that now he, here he is with no weight in the bow of the boat. He's at the stern operating the outboard. So when he'd get to the top of a wave, the wind would spin him around like a compass or like a wind vane and he'd lose control and he'd go down into the trough. He'd be okay in the trough, but you know, Great Lakes waves, they're not rollers. They don't have uniform troughs. They're, they're erratic and con confusing and overlapping. So he's trying to stay in the troughs, but he keeps getting thrown up on the top of a crest and boom, he gets spun around again. Within minutes, he completely lost, got lost. He was completely um, without any sense of where the island was way out of sight of land by this time as light night was falling and the snow squalls were closing everything off. All he had to go by was the direction of the wind, which was also confused, but um, he had a general idea. So he decided to try circling. So he was just doing his best to circle, and he just thought, there's no way I can find this person. There's, there's no hope. And suddenly he came over the crest of a wave, and right below him is a capsized boat with two two men clinging to the, to the hull. And he made a snap decision. He saw they were separated, so he knew his only hope was to drive right up onto the, that hull and try to get those guys in his boat. And he did that, pulled right up on top of it, reached on, grabbed the first one, and realized that it was his nephew. And the other one was his, his um, no, the other one it was his cousin, and the other one was his uncle. So it was his uncle and his uncle's son. And he grabbed the, the young man first and was able to pull him into the boat, and he w was too hypothermic and exhausted to even talk. And then a wave hit him, separated the boats, and within seconds again, he lost sight of, of the boat. All he could do again, start to circle, and again, bang, there it is right in front of him. Did the same thing, pulled up on it, grabbed, grabbed um, his uncle, pulled him into the boat. And by this time, his cousin had recovered enough that he could speak a little, and he said, are we going to live? And John said, he goes, oh, yeah, of course we are. But in his heart, he said, no, there's no way we're going to survive this because I don't know where we are, and these waves are way too big. Um, so with both men in the boat, kind of stabilized the weight a little bit. He had a little better, better control, but when he, he accelerated to um, get off the boat that they, you know, the others had been on, um, the engine stalled. And suddenly, he's going sideways with a big wave coming and about to hit him, and he's cranking away, and it just started in time. He was able to spin into the wave and, and, and make it over it. And so all they could do now, it's almost dark, the wind is continuing to increase, and he just starts going in circles again. And somehow, and in, in what he described as a miracle, there was Taquamanon Island with, with the other guys on shore waving and they pulled him up and got him into shore. John said he fell to his knees on the sand and thought, I am the luckiest son of a bitch on earth. 
So they got in the cabin and got into the, or in the shack and got the, close to the furnace and they, and they knew they were going to be okay. Well, they had a transistor radio and they're trying to, to pick up a station, but it, the battery was weak and they couldn't pick up a station. So they decided to wait till morning to use it in case um, the signal might be clearer in the morning. It, it, they were hoping the storm would pass. In the morning, they did turn on the radio and they found a station and the very first thing they heard was that the it, Fitzgerald had gone down just west of Whitefish Point and it was feared lost. The very first thing they heard. So you could have heard a pin drop in this museum. It was it was just an amazing experience to, to hear this this first hand account of of the power of the lakes. And of course the 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 connection with these people in, in the room was, was unbelievable. And I realized the only way to tell the story of the Great Lakes is to tell the stories of the Great Lakes. And suddenly my way seemed really clear. I just needed to tell these stories. And I needed to get out in a boat. So I needed to get off the shore, get out there, explore these lakes the way people have always explored them on the water. And I did. I set off for, for the next two years. I canoed, I sailed, um, and, um, and fished in power boats, and um, finally had the great, amazing good luck to get a spot as a crew member on the Malabar sailing from Lake Michigan to Bar Harbor, Maine, and suddenly the whole, the whole perspective changed. So in the years since, I have found myself in the role of, um, of uh, I guess, a, a bit of a champion of the Great Lakes. I, I, it's become important to me to help spread the word about the lakes. And one of the ways I can do that is by talking to students. And I, I've noticed a really interesting thing in just the last year. Um, I started seeing it a few years ago, but in the last year it's been dramatic. Um, Ten years ago when I was going around talking to students, um, I was being met with some, some lack of interest, and um, those of you who are teachers <laughs> know what I mean. And, um, you know, and I just kind of took that as part of the, of the terrain and didn't worry about it, just figured that there's a few in every group that are going to care enough to um, get involved or, or want to learn more. But suddenly, I'm going and I'm going to these universities and colleges and these events that are advertised with posters on the wall and instead of 10 or 20 students showing up, there's 100 or 200. Um, one, there was 600. And they're, they're coming, and they're not only coming um, to give their time to hear about the lakes, they're coming with questions, and they're coming with knowledge. I've never seen so many who know so much about the lakes. They're studying them in school, but they're also studying them on their own. And they all want to talk about their experiences. They all want to tell their stories. And they all want to know what they can do what they can do to help. I, it, it was so marked, marked and dramatic that I started asking every school I went to, I'd say, okay, and I would tell them, your, your classmates a few years ago weren't nearly as interested. What is going on? Why is it? And they all have a lot of ideas, um, but one that's come up at every school, where I've, every event where I've asked that, somebody, at least one person has said, well, we know we don't have any jobs waiting for us when we get out of school, so we want to do something good with our time. We want to help the world in a, in a better way. And I'm seeing that also with social justice issues. All across the board, these students really are getting involved. So I've been also talking to a lot of teachers, elementary school teachers on up through universities. And the teachers have the same attitude. These kids want to learn. Um, one, one teacher in Milwaukee told me five years ago that um, he had students in his class in inner city Milwaukee, two miles from the shore of Lake Michigan. Every year he had kids who had never seen Lake Michigan. Now he's taken these kids on field trips and they're doing beach cleanups and teaching water ecology and freshwater ecology. And they're engaged, they're involved. The Inland Seas Education Association in Sutton's Bay, Michigan, just recently put their 80, 80th 80,000th student through their, their ships program where they take kids out to learn about freshwater ecology. And I'm starting to meet graduate students who went on those, went on those tours 10 years ago in elementary school who say their lives were changed by it. So there's some reason for optimism. And I know in your work, you might sometimes lose track of that. 
But there are some good optimistic stories to be told and to hear these days. So thank you.